Welcome back, everybody. Well, we have a lot to go over. We're going to jump right into it. We're going to cover the S&P and how we're rallying up. This video, we're going to cover what's going on with growth. We're going to cover what's going on with the blackout period, why certain names are breaking out, why other names are not breaking out. Let's get to it. To start, this was the big news in the day. Reuters came out with the news at 1145. If you were on the pre-market live call we do every morning, we announced that this was what was happening and that you were going to see a rally. Also, with what's happening in France, which we will cover. This is something that's going to be of issue, but let's take a look at why they did what they did. Goldman Sachs has raised 24 year end target on the S&P index from 5,600 to 52, citing strong earnings growth by five mega cap US tech stocks and higher fair value on PE ratio multiple. Now this is where it gets really important. The drivers include upward revisions to consensus on 2024 earnings estimates for the same tech companies and valuation expansion stemming from increased investor enthusiasm about AI. All right, so AI is driving the ball, we know this, but it's spreading and, it, and we're gonna get into where it's spreading because they took up the S&P numbers, but they didn't take up the corporation numbers. And this is where the, the edge is, we're gonna get to it. Uh, but you're gonna, you're gonna wanna watch this part because there's, there's real value here. The upgraded target reflects the upside of about 3.1%. The brokerage expects roughly unchanged real, year, real yields by the end of the year and strong earnings growth to support a 15 PE. You'll know real yields, but we've gone over this a couple times, but we've also gone through the equity risk premium. This is a really important concept, but let's dive into this a little deeper. Now, what Goldman said, Evercore said on Sunday, Target went from 47.50 to 6,000. Strong potential from the AI revolution. People are still calling this a fad, it makes me laugh. The brokerage upgraded the information tech from underperformed to inline, welcome to the party, saying the sector benefits from structural demographic trends. All right, this language is really important. Pay attention to this part. Structural versus cyclical. If they say cyclical, they mean one to two years. If they're saying stru structural or systemic, they're referring to five to seven years. They're referring out much further. They're using this word on purpose because this is a multi-year movement and we're gonna to get to that in a second. But let's take a look at all this and where this is all leading. Now we all know the NASDAQ continued to push. People are gonna say how much higher can it go? We're gonna debate that in a second here. What we need to do is look at what's going on under the hood. Now what we're seeing here is from Morgan Stanley Research. And what it's showing us very clearly are a couple things that are worth note. It's showing us the economic surprises for growth. And what is happening there? Okay, economic growth surprises. Well, we're not having those. Okay, economic inflation surprises. Well, we were having those. Has been mixed with weaker growth and hotter inflation relative to forecasts. Well, why are they taking the earnings up? They're taking the earnings up because the exact opposite of what was happening recently is no longer ha happening. And this is really important. This just started to change. Not like two weeks ago, a week ago. And so what you're gonna see here is this is gonna start having better growth and inflation is gonna start coming down. I wanna say that again. You're gonna start seeing better growth and you're gonna start seeing inflation come down. We saw CPI, we saw PPI, and we know that that's important, right? We know that it was weaker than expected. Stay with me, we're getting there. Now this article by Morgan Stanley was titled Mixed Data, and that was the first slide of Mixed Data. This is the other slide that they were talking about that they were saying this is why it's confusing. Trailing earnings growth is turning higher driven by margin improvement. Margin's what you sell something for. You buy a banana for a dollar, you sell it for two dollars, the difference is your margins. If you look at net margins year over year up here, it's actually going higher and been going higher. If you look at earnings going up, they're going up too, they're in black. And then you have sales, which is revenue. And what is that doing? It's been stagnant, hasn't it? Now, the interesting thing about this, and I can't dive into it, if you look at it, it's actually doing something very similar to this, and then going this way, and then starting to turn up. So if sales start increasing, and this is why they titled the piece Mixed Data, if sales start increasing just a little bit, with all the cost cutting they've done for margins, then earnings per share, you see how it's forming a hockey stick? We call this the hockey stick. That's why it's going up. And that's why Goldman and Evercore are saying what they're saying. But there's actually more to this. It's not just gonna be the US. Taiwan had its earnings raised by Goldman 24, 25, 26, all raised. That was the move that we saw today on Taiwan Semi. Now this is not a dragonfly, I wish it was, you still have a hammer up here, but the reason for the push is they're predicting 20 or 30% growth, depending upon certain models, of the whole Taiwanese stock market. The only way that that's gonna happen is semiconductors. And I don't think that this cycle of where we're watching the KLACs of the world, and we're gonna get to this in a second, 
I don't think that all these semiconductor equipment manufacturers, which are just rocking, are gonna do this just upon AI. I think there's another cycle and we're gonna to get to that. Now, we've had data come out and this is significant. Just stay with me as this is all, all connected. So this is what's come out so far. We've had core CPI, core PCE, core CPI May. Then we had the Fed meeting. And then you can see the month over month. And what they do is they standardize the three months and annualize it out. And then they take the six months and they annualize it out and they take the year over year. And what you're gonna see is pretty simple stuff, right? If you take the three month versus where you're at, you can see how we're dropping, right? But we have this little blip down here on core CPI. And when they start looking at that, they're getting a little nervous, right? And that's where the, the issue came in. Where we're starting to go is all those numbers dropped all these three month and six month. They dropped them all down precipitously. That was really good. Now, what Powell did in that conference call, which was an absolute dumpster fire, was just not really explain what they're looking for at all. He came out and basically said, well, we want you know it to be under PCE to be under 28. That's our estimate, 28. And everybody came out and said, well, you're at 275. So are you saying inflation's gonna go up? And he's like, well, no, we're not saying it's gonna go up. And this is why everybody was confused and referred to it as the blazing saddles of FOMC meetings, which is funny if you ever watch Blazing Saddles, which is an absolutely hysterical movie. But nonetheless, these are all the dates that you have left, and you might wanna screenshot this, before your next meetings. So before the next meeting, we have an FOMC, core PCE, CPI, and then you have this coming out again before the 18th. This is really important to get. So let's say that they do cut interest rates. Well, what's that gonna do? Well, when they cut interest rates, clearly the market goes down at the start of any Fed cut, right? Well, not so fast. What we need to do is focus on the exact times that are like this, where you're actually going to increase productivity at the same time you're cutting rates, right? So increase and at the same time you're cutting rates. That's much better. All right. And what we're going to see again, when are you cutting rates? I'll get this eventually. And you're increasing productivity. There's only a couple times on this sheet historically where we've seen this, okay? In the past 40, 50 years. And the times for me that, that fit the most are the 80s, 84 specifically, and then you would have 95 and 98. They fit the most because you had increased productivity in 84 and you had increased productivity in 95 and 98. You can go and pull it for yourself and go look at the in increased productivity year over year chart and this is what you're gonna get. You could actually say you have an 80 as well, but that's tied to oil, so I'm not using that one. That said, to me, the most obvious thing here is to think about this is tied to 95 and 98, even though if you go and take a look at 84 and you go take a look at when you started seeing the Microsofts of the world go public, you'll get why I like this 84 level. But nonetheless, after the first cut, what happened in 95? We went higher, then we went higher, and then nine months later, we were much higher, and 12 months higher. 98, we were much higher, much higher, much higher. Okay? And then you go back down here to 84, higher, higher, sold off. Okay, are we getting this? I've been saying for some time, I think we're like 98, 95. Is that gonna happen? I don't have a clue. This is how I'm positioning myself for it. But you never know how this is gonna go. You just don't. Right now, we're seeing signs of that. Why? How can you say you're seeing signs of that? Well, what are they saying? They're saying that they're going to increase earnings and rates are gonna drop at the same time. Rates are that way. They would drop that way right down, I'll get it with these new arrows. Got switch computer system, so bear with me. But you get it, if you're increasing productivity, your, your EPS is gonna go up. If, and yeah, it's five names, but it's going to spread, it always does. And as it spreads, that's gonna to lead to what? That pushing. As that continues to push and go higher, EPS goes higher, productivity picks up of other corporations that use the technology, which then feeds it, right? It's all connected. Now this is where people are getting confused. And I'm really packing in broad concepts so that you can get it and then I'm gonna dive deeper into them this week. So if this is okay to go this broad, just comment below so I know, but there's a lot here. And I'm watching what, what's going on in the community and I'm able to interact in there during the day and say, hey, this is, this is what's going on. I'm trying to give everyone else just kind of a broad sense of where we're at and then I'm, I'll dive into it. But this is important, I've shown this three times now. I showed it last Saturday, I'm showing it again tonight and I showed it a couple weeks ago. The skew is changing. The skew, everyone's like, what is the skew? The skew is the volatility. So here's the three month skew, okay? And then basically what you're doing is looking at where are we now? And then why is this changing? And we'll get into it. So if we look at where we're at now, right up, down, you're right around this level at this particular time. And if you look at that line, you can see how you're lower than everything. Why is this different? Because when you're in an environment where the Fed is incentivizing long asset exposure, you get a steeper skew. So if the Fed wants you to buy assets, it does what? It cuts 
rates or leaves low interest rates, right? And you can see from 09 to 2020 what happened. And that created what? Okay, a long skew, which gave us what? Huge volatility. And this is what people aren't getting. The volatile market that you're seeing right now is normal. There's a reason why people don't own or didn't own their entire portfolio in technology stocks. It was the volatility. If there's no volatility and you're gonna get the best return in technology stocks, why wouldn't you buy it? But if technology stocks are gonna move 10, 20 points a day, then you wouldn't do it because you would want some of your capital to be more liquid while you waited. What people are doing is they're waiting for this market to correct like it's done in the past. This is not the same market, right? This is a clear example of adapt or die. Okay, and what you need to get, and why I keep going over this chart, is because we're turning, and this is a multi-year turn, and people are not getting this turn. And you have to understand that just because you see something go like this and drop, does not mean it's not gonna go back up anymore. Th those days of it just being so clear are over. And you're seeing that, even when I'm shorting names, sometimes I'm saying it, but let's keep going. Tightening the Fed needs negative wealth effect to fight demand side inflation. So when the Fed tightens, it needs negative wealth effects to fight demand side inflation. That means under owned assets. That means you have huge high cash. We have more cash now than we've ever had, right? That doesn't require hedging. You don't have to hedge cash. Cash just earns 5%, correct? That means the skew stays flat. That's why the volatility is where it is. And people keep going, I don't understand the VIX is broken. The VIX is not broken. You just have a flat skew now because the Fed is tightening and you're creating a negative wealth effect, demand side inflation. Nomura put this out, not me, and they did an excellent job with this. They're explaining a very tough concept to get and a very advanced concept to get in, in, in what I think are layman's terms. New easy policy era about to begin globally. Who cut rates? Canada, okay? We're seeing some other cuts across the globe, aren't we? We're hearing about more cuts across the globe. And we have to talk about how the globe is going to affect all of this, which could mean return to steeper skew regime. Here's your steeper skew. Look at how you're going up. This is what we want. You want this if you're a trader. You don't want this if you're a trader. You want the volatility because you can take advantage of the volatility, right? You want the volatility. Now, let me show you this. What I'm doing is overlaying Fed funds over from 05 on. Now, if we just go back to here, we can overlay it from 09 on. 09 is when we went to zero interest rates. After the correction, what happened? You had zero interest rates. What happened to the VIX this entire time? See how it just kept dropping and dropping and dropping, even though you still had tons of volatility in the market from 09 on? See how you spiked? here during the pandemic, and then you went flat again and how it dropped. See how we raised on Fed funds and how Fed funds are about to drop and come down? So as that happens, and as we see the drop in the Fed funds price, what will happen is the VIX will drop. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna get the volatility in the market, you're still gonna get the volatility, but institutions aren't gonna care. They're going to expect the volatility. And that's important. There's two other things that are driving us right now besides this. And I know I'm going through some big concepts, but these are really important concepts because they're affecting your day-to-day -day trading and you can't figure out why you're getting whacked around like a pinata. Let me point out two other things. We are becoming the only game in town. And what I mean by that is with what's going on in the world with France right now, just to point this in perspective, France economics since Monday's open, look at what's happening to their spreads. They're exploding because of what's going on there, crisis of confidence with Macron. I don't know what's going on as far as how this is gonna play out. I am far from a geopolitics expert, but this is one thing that's really throwing us off. And I think that's important. Now watch this. If you go and take a look, EWQ, okay? You're just falling out of bed. Let's go here and I'm not gonna have time to edit this. And you're trying to hold. Now maybe you do hold here and that would be great. But what we're seeing is a delevering and I see, I'm seeing a levering of US and US assets. And this can also drive us. Because if we risk on US assets, they're gonna risk on everything. Okay, what does that mean? They buy our assets. They don't wanna buy European assets right now, sorry guys, but they don't because they're worried about the uncertainty of what's going on over there. Even though France is only 14% of the EU domestically, which I thought was fascinating, but watch this. So you have names like Hermes that are completely washed out, Louis Vuitton, and these are gonna present opportunities. Do they present opportunities today? The vote's June 30th, I don't know. I think they're worth watching. But in the meantime, what we're seeing is you are seeing a deleveraging of anything over there. Whereas look at NVO coming down today. What they were doing, if you were watching the tape today, it was crazy to see, but if I take NVO and I turn NVO into a line and I come here with Lily and pop Lily in, which usually they look at, look at how they trade. I mean, it's perfect. They're like, you know, brothers almost, right? Then you drop this into a one minute chart. 
Okay, and it's like the party's over, why? They're deleveraging Europe and they're reinvesting assets into the US. This is another catalyst despite the other things that people were talking about. We still haven't even gotten into what we started this conversation with. So let's jump right into it and go. So you see this, see this is happening? Okay, it's not just this, it's everything and it's really important to get this concept. If they delever Europe like this, this is a big deal because they were going after Europe and they were going after, now how, how deep does this go? I don't know, but you're seeing these disparities all over the place. Now, my first concern was this, the distribution of S&P buyback blackouts started on the 14th, which means we lose a big guy, meaning the institutions that buy their own stock back, they're not able to do that anymore. And since they're not able to do that anymore, this is where we start running into a problem. But what they're doing is they're diversifying out the discounted assets that are in the market. And that's what they're buying. They're not just buying the, the high flyers. Now we started the beginning of this video by explaining that Goldman's taking their numbers up and they're raising their estimates, but you didn't see them raise any companies. And I think that this is where we can do very well. But I'd be crazy to not point this out. So about a month ago, actually about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I said, you're forming a cup and a handle on the Qs relative to the SPY. Qs divided by the SPY, break this down. And I, again, lots of concepts. You're probably gonna to wanna to watch parts of this again. And I'll fill this in and go deeper during the week. But this part of it, I'm really watching people struggle as they're watching SMCI drop 50 points and they're not understanding that this is the new normal. So if you look here, right, what's happening? You're breaking out, turn this into a line. Where do you see this? Well, I think it's fun. I think it's interesting, okay? Look where you're at here. Let's do this on a weekly. You're over. You're completely cleared of everything. You're at all time highs on the NASDAQ versus the SPY. And people are gonna go out there and they're gonna call it and say it's too high. It's like watching a ball get knocked out of the park and say it's too high, it's not a home run. It's nonsense. What you have to do is figure out why it's happening. And this is why I think it's happening. I told you we were gonna bring it home. So on this conference, when this conference hit, I was calling it a nothing burger in here. And then the next day I saw what they were doing and I'm like, oh, I get it. They're going to cycle out everything old for new. And if you don't have the new, you can't get the new product. You can't get access to AI. If you can't get access to AI on your iPhone or on your iPad, unless you have the 15 or the brand new iPad or iPad Pro, this is gonna be a multi-year cycle. Now, you know who benefits from this besides Apple? Qualcomm. And look at Qualcomm after hours tonight, up two. And look at the rally. Here, it was a 207 and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't moving. What else is moving that deals with mobile? Arm. See how these names are moving? Now, has anyone seen ARM's earnings taken up recently? No. Has anyone seen anybody take up Qualcomm's earnings recently? No. Has anyone taken up Apple's earnings recently? No. So you have Goldman going out there and saying, we're taking up our earnings estimates because of mega cap tech, but yet no one has raised their earnings estimates on Apple, on Qualcomm, or on ARM. Do you think that that might be where this is heading? 